having our conversation with with Edward Ayers. Ed, thank you for being here. Thanks, Ted. My pleasure. And uh, um, and uh, at the end of this discussion of of Edward Ayers' Southern Journey, the Migrations of the American South, 1790 to 2020. Toward the end, uh, people should feel free to, uh, to send their questions in through the, the chat box and we will get to as many of those as we can. And thank all of you for being here. Uh, you'll notice also that we have, um, that our, our words are at the bottom of the screen uh, as well. And so um, the, uh, uh, and I won't give a long introduction. I hope that's okay. Um, Edward, Edward Ayers at the University of Virginia as a professor of history. He's, uh, he and I have been uh, shared Southern historian, Southern studies people for multiple uh, decades now and is the author of books that everyone in Southern history uh, knows and reads and assigns um, in uh, Southern history and five books in Civil War history and lots of work in editing and has been a, a friend at the Gilder Jordan Lecture and the uh, Porter Fortune Symposium. Um, and has this new book that we're talking about, and I know it's hard to talk about new books in a pandemic, so thank you for joining uh, uh, through Zoom. Um, two questions before we get into the, the, uh, the content, really. Uh, the second may get into the content. Uh, one is these were the Fleming Lectures at Louisiana State University, and the second one is that this book, which is I see over your left shoulder, this book is a unusual size for a historian's book. Uh, it's long, it's lean. Um, so could you tell us what the, the Fleming lectures are? And, um, um, and it is getting into the content of the book to say why, is it, why does it have an unusual size? Right. Thanks a lot, Ted. I will only add that uh, I'm at the University of Richmond now after having been at the University of Virginia for 27 years. Yes. So uh, I have identifications with both places, but uh, I just want to be sure that my oh, current sure. employer knew that <laughs> where I am, uh, where I was president for eight years. And so I'm, I'm devoted to that. So, yeah, so, and it ties into your question because uh, eight years I was president, uh, it's hard to be a productive scholar when you're basically going to cocktail parties for a living. Um, and, uh, but the Fleming lectures that they, they wrote and said, would you be willing to do that? And uh, of course, yes, it, it's, a, it's a great honor for a Southern historian, but I didn't know what I was going to talk about. And uh, also I had another book to finish, this volume two of the, about the Civil War that had been sort of kind of idling for 14 years while I was dean and president. So I wouldn't say I was panicked, but I would say that it's not exactly obvious where I would come up with the idea for a new book after just finishing one and the presidency. But I realized I had two passions uh, that joined together here. One, I've had the stubborn belief that historians should be able to think of something to do with a global network of information exchange and visualization. I've been doing the digital stuff for 30 years now. Keep thinking that we'll think of something cool to do with it. Uh, we basically use it to send PDFs around, but I know that there, I knew there had to be more to it. And as a result, um, I was a partner with uh, the Digital Scholarship Lab at the University of Richmond, uh, where they had done amazing projects, and maybe we can sh talk about some of them later if people like, uh, with American Panorama, a, a digital atlas of American history that, that I'd helped start. And on that, in that atlas, they had these great maps of the forced migration of enslaved people in the United States that showed with this innovative method I'd never seen before called hex bins, where they dissolve the landscape into places much smaller than counties with little hexes and then the data fills in that. Um, and they showed, you could see the, the, the domestic slave trade draining Virginia and filling Mississippi and Louisiana. And so when I was thinking uh, about the Fleming lectures, I thought my other great passion has been to set the South in motion. You know, we, we, you and I both have been working for decades against the idea that it's all sort of born the South and there it is and it's never changing. And we tried different ways to set it in motion. So I thought, well, if I could have my friends be willing to make these maps for all of Southern history and include black and white and immigrant and native peoples in it, uh, that would be a great way to give me enough to fill three lectures. <laughs> and uh, 
So the Fleming Lectures usually eventuate in a book of maybe 100 pages of a smaller size. And so with a predilection I have to make everything as hard as it can possibly be, I said, hey, first of all, let's do 230 years. B, let's devise an entirely new way of making maps. And three, let's include everybody. <laughs> and then let's also make it really hard to make a book. So I want to thank two groups of people in all this. One, Justin Madron and Nathaniel Ayers at the Digital Scholarship Lab who devised this method and then who made the hundred or so maps that I requested, even when they seem completely crazy to people who don't live in Southern history all, all the time. Um, and who were, you know, when I first gave the lectures at LSU, they were wrong colors. They didn't really convey the sense of what I was trying to show. So we came back and we, and we really had no model, had to make them over and over again. We'll look at some of these a little bit later so people get out of what we're talking about. But the other thing was that LSU, the press said, Sure, we'll make a book, you know, that is this format. And it feels good too. I don't know how you describe that kind of a map thing, but then with a the fabric. And then big enough to include, you know, these beautiful maps and if not eloquent words, enough words to try to explain all of Southern history in one book. And, and I say this not, I say this in admiration, not as a sales pitch, for $39.95, it's amazing that LSU. So I'm extraordinarily grateful to them for doing that. And they were great sports too. Final thing, they let us add maps so that this book actually includes the COVID crisis. And so that's how late in the, this process, the book came out in November and they were still letting us add things in the summertime. So we had to do that. So uh, I'm the one who gets to talk to you, but uh, we can see this is a deeply collaborative effort for which I'm very grateful. But the whole point is what if we included everybody? And what if we set things in motion? That's the, the point of the book. My impression is that um, most people who have studied migrations study one migration at a time, one group or one process or one series of issues. Um, you're already talking about it. What is it accomplished by studying all the migrations uh, is it comparative? Is it connected? Is it just broadening and giving a full story? Yeah, well, if I can share my screen, I can show a map that would give some examples. I'm going to tap share screen now and I'm going to go to this and I'm hoping that a map will appear on the screen. It appears that it has. So if I can explain this map, people will understand how all the others work. So areas that are varying shades of brown are where the population of that particular demographic is growing. Places that are varying shades of blue is where it's declining. So this is black population change in the first decade of the 19th century. And you can see uh, Tidewater, Virginia, you're seeing coastal uh, Carolina, and you're seeing uh, sort of the very first places that uh, uh, slavery had been exported uh, in the bluegrass of Kentucky declining already. So already <laughs> you're seeing the domestic slave trade at work. But also we're seeing that Mississippi is a part of the story from the very beginning uh, because of Natchez and obviously of New Orleans. And so uh, you can see there that the population is growing in the Piedmont of Georgia and South Carolina, also the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee and also the bluegrass. And it's still expanding here in the Piedmont of Virginia. So this is usually we're picturing the domestic slave trade. It's big arrows that kind of go from the upper south to the lower south. It's really not uh, individuated at all. But the other thing to answer your question in part, we look at white population change in the same time. First of all, you see how many people are getting the heck out of Virginia and but are abandoning upcountry South Carolina, upcountry Georgia and, and parts of Tennessee. This is where I'm from. And that, so people live there like five years before they stop, start leaving. <laughs> uh, and what you see is that in profoundly different patterns of white and black population. Now, I think for the antebellum era, as I resist calling it, but uh, the era of slavery, uh, people don't really have a very clear idea, ironically, of what white population change looked like. We don't really, you know, it's the pioneers, you know, it's Thomas Sutton coming into Mississippi at some time, but we don't know how. This allows us to actually see that 
white and black patterns follow profoundly different patterns. And we can also see as things unfold over time that there's almost white flight from the beginning. Poor white people know they cannot afford to live in the land that the planters are coming in and buying the best land and import and bringing in enslaved people. So what this does is we don't usually think about the first decade of the 19th century being very interesting for migration, but you can see how the places that end up the upper South is, is uh, settled. Now, we can, you know, one of the things that you can do if you come to the Digital Scholarship Lab, you can look at these maps. You can compare 1810 to 1820. So that's white population change. And then look how much more targeted black population change. So white people basically going where they want to go, where there's cheap land, and black people being taken where they can be put to work. But another important thing, and so you'll be able to watch this over each decade, and as you can see, if you sort of scroll through, you can see how it's animation. But another thing I wanted to do is to make us remember just how late in the slave period land was occupied by the native peoples. And this animation, which is replicated in the book, you can actually watch the interaction of black and native and white population movement and how much it was that the shape of the South that we know was created by uh, the dis dispossession of enslaved people. So here, for example, the black population change, you can see that this is the beginning of the South that we know. Enslaved people being taken out of the upcountry of Georgia and moved into the Black Belt. And look how early Mississippi Delta, but also moving into the uh, middle part of, of Mississippi is settled. So, but you can also look at the, we need to remember a million enslaved people moved to the domestic slave trade. And you can see here in Virginia and coastal South Carolina where they're coming from, right? So to answer your question, that shows how the three peoples uh, of the area of slavery, how their histories were so deeply intertwined that they cannot be pulled apart even though we always do. Uh, and I think you know, restoring uh, Native American history to the story of the American South is, um, necessary for us to understand how the larger story of slavery unfolds. Now I can talk about other parts of Southern history if you'd like me to keep going or I can pause for a moment and let you ask me another question. What would you prefer? We'll, we'll probably do the same thing. Uh, um, the, uh, uh, I think, yeah, I mean, you're, you're doing a, a, a really clear job. Thank you for of showing what the uh, of, of showing what the book accomplishes and uh, uh, emphasizing the maps. Um, I liked how you showed the book, put the book up. The maps are, are most often, you know, paired with your own words, uh, kind of a survey of Southern history through the issue of migration, uh, which is intriguing uh, uh, in itself. Uh, I thought one way to, to, to help um, to help people uh, who've tuned in, thank you, uh, to, to understand the book, would be to yeah to, to ask a few specific questions and that may uh, get you away from um, things that are queued up um, but just some specific places um, could you could you talk about uh, pre Civil War Texas that seems that that exemplifies some things in your book that that are some some large questions in your book that that are uh, probably worth mentioning yeah and here's a case where you know the the book is dedicated to my graduate students at Virginia. Uh, where I taught for 27 years and, and was fortunate to have quite a few students. And one of them, Andrew Torget, who's a professor at University of North Texas, uh, taught me everything that I know about slavery uh, in Texas and had his own mapping project. He helped lead the Valley of the Shadow project in his last latest stages. And so what you see here is, you know, starting in the 1840s, that Texas is a, basically recapitulates Southern history in 20 years. It goes from basically being possessed by settler colonialism, populated by uh, white settlers and enslaved people, turned into a remarkably uh, valuable uh, cotton producing area, decides it needs to be its own uh, place. And so you can see here it's spanning. So that's black population change, 1850 to 1860. You see how it's being taken into Texas more black people than white people, uh, which I think contradicts a, a more rapid growth of enslaved population than white, which contradicts so much of what people, 
how they imagine the story, the Alamo and all that, right? Um, and so you might have looked at Texas if you were a, a Southerner, white Southerner inclined towards secession and realized that trying to create a new nation based on the command of the global cotton supply wasn't going to work out. <laughs> uh, that, uh, and instead, uh, the white South followed the path of Texas uh, and into secession. So, you know, as we go through up to the present, Texas and Florida, of course, uh, are uh, places that are really dynamic. But the thing is that history, ha Texas has a history that's not the one that we usually imagine when we're thinking about it and how quickly it became uh, the locus of uh, plantation slavery. Okay. And, um, Oklahoma as well? Um, yeah, Oklahoma, three... Oklahoma. Now, so I will have, I will go into the 20th century uh, where we begin um, including the whole United States. Before this, I've not because African-American people are basically confined to the South, uh, their movements. But as we start getting into the 20th century, uh, you can start seeing here that Oklahoma for black people is already declining after World War II, right? Uh, and so, but if we go into the middle of the 19th century, uh, and where we, and we kind of, talk all about the Civil War and all those kinds of topics. But we can see that Oklahoma becomes a place uh, of, whoops, of possibility uh, for black people. We know about the Tulsa riot and so forth. But migration is, you know, starting in the 1870s and 1880s, um, excuse me, while the map is refreshing itself and talking about all the refugee societies. Uh, you can see here, uh, immediately following the Civil War, one of the things, that the maps that I showed before, I, I realize your question is about Oklahoma, but I'm going to pander about Mississippi for a second. The places- That was, where, that was another question, so you're answering it before I ask it. Okay. okay. The, the point being is that Oklahoma is briefly a place of opportunity for Black people, mm -hmm. but pretty quickly it becomes a place that they are leaving, is the thing that I would say. Mississippi has one of the most interesting demographic histories right. uh, of all of this. Here's an example of places that were most heavily occupied by the United States Army during the Civil War end up being the places where African-American people leave uh, because A, they have now a way to get out, <laughs> uh, but it's also uh, a place that white people uh, are abandoning uh, to, to a certain extent. So the Mississippi Delta is a place of, and it's perplexing. I mean, I, I know I'm the first person to ever point out how surprising and complex the history of the Mississippi Delta is. But demographically, it violates some of our ideas of what we expect to happen. You know, so for example, so this is black population change uh, in 1890 to 1900. And you can see that the Mississippi Delta is a place to which black people are flooding, that they're still fleeing upper, the upper South and moving to the Black Belt and to Mississippi. Now, to a lot of people who don't live in Mississippi, uh, this is surprising. They imagine that uh, the South is, uh, the Deep South has always been a place that Black people were leaving, but far more the first 50 years of emancipation because Black people were not welcome in the North, this was the land of opportunity. Uh, my former student, John Willis, has written this great book about the forgotten opportunities of the Mississippi Delta. But what happens is that and you'll, here you'll see this white flight I'm talking about. Look at that. The same decade, white people are basically not moving to Mississippi, and they're certainly not moving to the Mississippi Delta, uh, lower south. But instead, what you're seeing is that it's uh, all these bright places. Those are cities. And we're all the, those people who've memorized promise of the new south know that I'm all about towns and cities. But what this shows us is how mobile uh, the, but also notice how people are still just leave, leaving Virginia. There's not really a decade until the last two or three decades where Virginia is growing. Uh, it's basically a place that's populating the, the rest of the South. So, um, you know, the boll weevil, cotton textiles, and so forth. But we, we know what this is. I, if, if we were a class, I would ask people, what are we looking at here? And this, of course, is the Great Migration which looks nothing like our textbooks, 
which is a big red arrow going up from <laughs> Mississippi River to Chicago. Instead, th this is sort of the technique, Ted, is like people have had an fMRI, you know, that I use these maps not as illustrations, but as puzzles to be solved, right? All those words in the book are really hard to write because I didn't know what I was going to say until I'd studied the maps. So here you'll see a puzzle. We see that people, just as we expect, black people fleeing the Black Belt and large parts of Mississippi, but look how many are moving to the upper delta and, and the delta of Arkansas. Now, during the decade of World War I. Now, there's all the growth that we're expecting in the Great Migration, right? And including to Tulsa, but Kansas City uh, and other places, as well as Birmingham, right? So it's going, why? Well, it's during World War I, cotton prices, as you know, skyrocket. And so you could easily say, you know, I'm already a skilled cotton farmer rather than taking my family to risk everything to go to Chicago, I'll just cross the river or go into the next county and get a bounty from these high cotton prices while I can, right? Uh, and so people need to understand that Southern history doesn't just stop in 1910 and black people leave, which is the way that it's imagined. There are still more black people living right? in the South in the 20th century than have moved out. You also see something I wasn't surprising moving to the Piedmont, uh, to these growing towns, right? And you talked before about Texas. Look how attractive the towns of Texas are. So when we picture the Great Migration, I think, um, you know, we've had a tendency to think of this as a great fleeing of the South, but it was also a great movement within the South. And so I think that's an important thing for people to understand. But you can see how Mississippi's population was just kind of drained. But the other thing to understand is that white people are not leaving at the same rate from the South. The other thing to understand though, look at the 1920s. Population is pretty much steady, but now all that black population is really focused. But in the 1930s, and you can also see the white migration, um, still avoiding the black belt. The white, the, this is the, a consistent theme throughout. White people are moving where black people are not. And then during the 1930s, ironically, it's taken this long for the boll weevil, which hit Mississippi and Texas so early to have the devastating effects in Georgia and South Carolina. So then people, then the great migration, and you can see Oklahoma, uh, the great migration then is shifting to the east, whereas parts of Mississippi are stabilizing and beginning to grow again. So it's in all those ways that things that we thought we knew look different. Then there's lots of things we didn't even think we knew that we could see these maps differently. So I think that's one of the most profound things is to understand that, you know, I often ask people, name something that happened in the South between the end of Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement. And I find that undergraduates often say, uh, W.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington argued with each other. <laughs> that's kind of what the, the U.S. history textbooks tell us, right? Instead, you have millions of people seeking new lives, black and white. And we, until we set the South back in motion, we're never going to understand well, where in the world does the civil rights movement come from? It comes from black people moving to these cities where they can create the institutions and the middle class, you know, the kind of the culture of respectability and the churches that allows them to fuel that. But people would think that going directly from the front porch of a sharecropper shack to Dr. King, we've left all the stages out that help explain how you would get there. Bringing that up uh, is, is kind of jumping my questions, which I had wonderfully numbered, and now those numbers are are, are no longer. Um, that that uh, um, frequently when we write books, we're whether intentionally or not intentionally, we're we're arguing against something, um, some in something incorrect or something left out dramatically, um, and sometimes it's intentional. And our young scholars younger than than. Than, than we are frequently say that that's their intervention. That's not a term that I grew up having. Um, but uh, um, you said you're wanting to set the South in motion. Um, uh, is there a clear thing in your mind as you wrote about what you're trying, you know, one or two or three things that you're trying to, um, to improve on or correct or, or get it right? Or is there an image of the South, one or two that, 
looking at migration helps overturn or dramatically correct? Yeah, um, I invoked one of them right now, which is people just sitting on the porch of a shack, another one sitting on out front of the general store, just waiting for history to happen to them. Um, and I think that the there's no one scholar or a school that I'm pushing against, but rather uh, I think that it's, we've written segregated history. Uh, we tend to write either the history of black people or white people or native people and to leave out immigrant people altogether, which we can look at later uh, for the most recent history. I think that the ratio of my paragraphs to the number of books I had to read was insane. Um, because what I found that this was more of a harvesting Ted than an intervention. A lot of people would have told me about, you know, Jeannie Wayne, about the Arkansas Delta. Well, that's really important to understand when I see that pattern and I'm trying to explain it. Or, you know, uh, we, we hear about, you know, agricultural history and the rise of the tractor. Well, while I'm trying to explain why some counties keep black people and others lose them, it turns out that the number of tractors they have. So I would say that it, it was more gathering insights, especially a lot of the things that, you know, when you and I cut our teeth in the social histories of the uh, 70s and 80s of community studies, uh, people would show how uh, an area was settled uh, or depopulated, but they were not connected to other communities. So it was more trying to um, pull together things across time. That's something else we don't do in Southern history very much. You know, it's rare to have a book that has the 18th and the late and the 21st century in it. Um, and to show that what they all have in common is that they were all moving. Um, so I think that that's, so to the extent that anybody in any of those eras is arguing for stasis uh, and stagnation, I'm arguing no, that the things that we have talked about like lynching and segregation and disfranchisement are the product of movement, not of just stagnation. And that's something I've been arguing about for a long time. And I don't know that I persuaded anybody. So I thought I'd take one more swing at it. <laughs> it's an argument that people are, are, are wondering about. Yes, that's a, yeah. The, uh, uh, thanks. There's, there's, uh, this question is actually connected to the last one. Um, because of the nature of the book and the nature of the Fleming lectures, uh, there's not a lot of discussion about um, individual perspectives and kind of cultural interpretation from the time period. Um, is that a, a strength or just something you had to leave out? But, but you know, some of the great interpreters of, of the migration experience um, kind of stay out because of the emphasis on, on so much data and how to interpret it. Yeah, I think, uh... As you know, I've seldom met, met an anecdote in my earlier work that I didn't like. I've severed, and so this isn't very unlike my earlier work. I mean, I wrote a thousand pages about two counties, which gives you some idea of how many individuals <laughs> are, are in there. I, but you know what I, what I think, Ted, is that this is the most democratic history I've ever written because it didn't require you to have left a letter or a diary or even appear in the newspaper. All you had to do was be there on the day the census taker took note of you, right? And so that, that's been the, sort of the guiding principle ever since I got into this stuff. You know, my first book on crime and punishment began in the late 70s, the idea we could use computers to see things that we couldn't see otherwise. So in my uh, understanding of what I was doing, it was to create a framework in which all those individual cultural histories can make sense and flourish. Um, you know, so I, I think that it's, um, we ran in flight from quantitative history. Uh, we, I joke that it was popular for a day we call Thursday, and then we decided it was a terrible idea. And as you know, I'm very interested in cultural history. And, and so it's not an aversion of that, but it struck me that if we could actually have a new framework in which all those, a moving framework in which all those stories had greater power and intensity, it would be a worthwhile diversion. So, you know, the, but I argue, you know, it, this has quite a bit uh, actually about politics in it. 
that actually has quite a bit about economic life. And so trying to understand, you know, the South that I grew up in uh, of, of uh, migrate, of tourism, of, you know, factory growth, and recently of immigration, uh, I think in some ways it was an attempt to describe the South that I knew where it came from. Uh, because now there's such a divergence between the South that people know today, which is the place where people are moving to. Uh, you know, I, I, I had a, uh, a, twi a tweet stream about, thread about uh, the Georgia election and how if you're gonna actually understand why what's happening in Washington today to understand how the Democrats have a majority and how Joseph Biden is the nominee, you have to look at the South and you have to go back to 1820 to understand why the most consistent basis of the Democratic Party is the same basis we've seen since the, the first enslaved population was taken there. And why it is that Georgia has suddenly, like Virginia earlier, flipped to blue. None of that it makes any sense without migration. And you'll see editorials and things inferring that, but acting like everybody who's moved to the South has moved there in the last 20 years from a suburb of New York and brought liberalism with them, rather than understanding that the South has been changing deeply from within and that more African-American people have moved to suburbs since 1970 than moved in the Great Migration. So if people wonder, where does Stacey Abrams come from? Where does this victory come from? It's a direct result of migration. So I think in some, time, some ways that, you know, I mean, Isabel Wilkerson's great book about the Great Migration uh, is very powerful, but I think this map right here shows things that her book doesn't show, right? And we can play, we can see it goes into the 1950s. And we can see it goes into the 1960s, black migration. But then look at that, 1970s. Now you're starting to see the origins of the South that we know today. So I believe that, and you can see all the cities where black people are moving and you can see Atlanta growing with special intensity, right? If you're gonna understand the culture and politics and economics of today, you have to understand this migration. So I think we've been looking past uh, the demographic and by doing so we've missed part of the story. So I see this as a compliment to cultural history, Ted, rather than a, a kind of a competitor or a displacement of it. I can imagine all sorts of people using some parts of this. Um, and I can imagine people using the whole book as a, as a like I said, a survey of Southern history. Um, I would hope that they would do this for very large classes. Uh, that's what they want to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's why you mentioned the price. I was like, yeah, yeah, no. exactly. But but what I've also mentioned is that if as we're trying to create broaden the important work that you're doing, in which we show that Southern history didn't stop in 1965, mm -hmm. uh, but that is continuing today. I'm going. to scrolling down to the very recent past and we can start moving over to uh, Q&A whenever you're ready. That's, that's the uh, COVID crisis, the native people. This is showing how the, the places that people are moving most in the United States, I'm sorry. The upper South, but look at the pattern that you see still from 1820. Right, but there's Atlanta. If you want to understand much about the, the politics of today, but what I wanted to show too is, uh, forgotten which order they are. Uh, the uh, I kind of like that map that I made of uh, the interstate highway system, and you can actually watch it evolving, which actually determines much of the population change. So this is something people don't tend to understand. This is people from Latin America to the United States in the first decade of our century. Fully a quarter of them have moved to the South and many of them have moved to the rural South and many of them have, uh, are from lots of different places in Latin America. And we know that Florida and Texas have a lot, but look how evenly distributed they are across the South. Um, so I think that if we're trying to show a new generation that Southern history is still a compelling way of understanding America, I think we need to come up to the present and to show how uh, the population from all over the world now 
is in many ways coming to the South. So I have a political purpose, which is to people to under to recognize that the South is shapes much of American political history and now much of American economic history. And why? It's because of migration. So you know, the theme of the book is that this is the single most important thing in Southern history is migration. I mean, it's a kind of audacious thing, but what the heck, it's only Zoom. <laughs> Yeah, and and I I'm not I, I I don't and I've known you long enough that, that I don't think anybody puts words in your mouth. But but I, I, uh, my my feeling reading what it was is if there's something that it's that it's doing that it's working against, it is the the assumption of um, that the that the South is rooted rootedness. The South is always about home. It's always about tradition. It's always about. Um, um, you know, clinging to cer certain definitions of the past. And, and, you know, you can work that into all sorts of questions about uh, um, migration uh, as well. Just, yeah, you know, I mean, so, you know, I'm from Appalachia and the, you know, I'm showing, but so look at this in, look at Appalachia, right? And so my family grew up on what they call the Hillbilly Highway to D Detroit, right? And so where does country music come from, right? So Southern culture has it become American culture and country music becomes so popular. And also what we call urban music now, by which we mean black music, right? How does that come about? That's also a product of Southern migration to the North, not to mention, you know, Atlanta hip hop and so forth, you know? And so I think that I do believe that segregating out varieties of history of cultural versus social versus economic versus political uh, also immobilizes us. And so I think that the, the digital can be a solvent to some of these um, structures that we have imposed upon ourselves. So not only do we segregate by, by the people we're studying, we also segregate by genre. And in some ways we segregate by time. So I thought that would be to show the one thing that everybody shares if you live in the South, you've lived in the South. <laughs> and if, you if you've not moved, that's history too, right? So it, it, stasis is a part of the story. As a matter of fact, why is Appalachia in trouble today? Because of outmigration, the same way that the Black Belt is, right? So a lot of the population of people who be paying taxes starting businesses are leaving and leaving older and poorer people there. Uh, and so what we think of often as cultural problems uh, also have their basis in, but migration is a cultural decision. These people have chosen to move once we get past 1860. This shows black agency more systematically and broadly than we've seen it before. And so, and it also shows that choosing to stay in the South was a political decision for black people that made sense. They're not like a residue of the people who went to the North, they are making their own history here. And I was trying to give a frame, frame of reference in which we can see that. So I find as I'm growing ever more animated that I do have sort of cultural and political purposes behind this, which is if you don't set the South in motion, you can't understand it in any period, including today. We have some questions that I'll, I'll read. Uh, I'm going to start with it because we're studying because your, our discussion has gotten right to the present. I'm going to talk about the start with a contemporary question uh, from uh, our colleague Kate Smith. Uh, do contemporary decades demogra demographic shifts appear relatively more or less dynamic? So does the 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 the, the, the speed of movement is it changing? Is it increasing or de declining? Yeah, I think this is something people are surprised to learn that we're living right now in the most stagnant period in American history. Uh, and so it's ironic that I would choose now to go back and talk about uh, dynamism of the past. Yeah, so, you know, if we go to, you know, I'll go this white pipeline so we can watch it unfold. You can see how, you can see the contrast there as late as the 1950s, even the 60s. But today, or from the 70s to on, it's basically urbanization and suburbanization, which helps explain the political 
situation of today of the red rural South, right? And the blue uh, growing suburban and urban South. So ironically, we're in a relatively static period right now. I think it's also the case that we expected Latin American migration to have a uniform political consequence that it's not turned out to have. Um, and so I think that what we're seeing now in many ways are more micro movements of people moving from one suburb or from the countryside to another uh, urban area. So I do think it, this is a relatively stable period now uh, for migration for black and white people. Yep, and just looking at the map right there, um, we need to talk about Florida at some point, I think, and, and you know, the way that the, I mean, uh, the way the term Florida man has within what, five years become suddenly this fascinating concept um, and uh, something to, to enjoy and play down. Um, but uh, several good questions uh, that, are, uh, that are historical. Um, the question, it appears on the 1840 to 1850 map that the concentration of slaves have moved to the deep south. Um, was, that, uh, was that accomplished to prevent slaves from escaping to the north or was it mostly due to demand? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm going to show 50 to 60 since I, it was easier to do without all the scrolling you know, people to go. Uh, Virginia remains the largest slave state in 1860. So there are more enslaved people, nearly half a million in Virginia. Uh, I believe that this is greed is what it is. It is um, the, the price, the differential of what an enslaved person is uh, cost uh, is so great regionally. I want to show a, a, a powerful map that that people can help help me, help me understand. Areas here that are yellow and brown are places where males predominate. Areas that are varying shades of green is where where women predominate. Okay, what does this show us? Well, it shows the sugar districts are consuming people. 90% of our men basically worked as hard as could possibly work. The women who were bought tend to be teenagers to bear children as long as they can. Why is Virginia like this? I believe because women have been, and girls have been bought by the great majority of the South where most slave owners own one, two or three people. And if you're gonna buy one person, you'd probably buy a woman. And over 60% of the small of people who own one enslaved person own a, a female. So what you're seeing here is, and this is building on the question, is the migration, uh, not so much to avoid escape as it is to pull families apart for maximum economic benefit. And so I don't know if that seems a plausible explanation for people. We just made this map and then I had to try to figure it out. I'd be lying if I said I understood all of it. I'm sorry, you can see this is the sugar districts of Texas as well that people tend not to, to think much about. But, and you can also see how the Delta is pulling people. You can also see how different parts of Mississippi, how different they are, of different uh, degrees of slaveholding. But if people wanna know the damage that slavery did, you can see it here county by county of separating men and women. So I believe, that, this is all driven by economic incentives. Thank you. There's a question from, from our uh, Southern Studies colleague, Adam Gusso, uh, talking about uh, James Lowen's book, Sundown Towns. Uh, Adam says, James Lowen argues, the preponderance of black folks who, who took part in the great migration ended up in Northern urban centers, not because they had necessarily preferred to be there, but because they had in effect been ethnically cleansed from large swaths of the Midwest by racist whites who drove them out of the sundown towns. Um, uh, do, do, these, do your maps um, help think about, uh, about that topic? Yeah, I think that they, what they show is the extent to which the great migration really was uh, an urban phenomenon, uh, partly because that's not only where the jobs are, but because that's where safety was. Uh, and let me just go down a little bit farther. Uh, and that I think Lowen's work is right that um, we're pulling up. So what you can see that in all these places, there's a movement to, to cities. 
Now, all we, as I mentioned before, Tulsa, we know what happened there, but the fact is, is that safety is in numbers. And people were, not only were there sundown towns in the Midwest, people simply, black people simply were not welcome in those places uh, in, during the great migration. So I, I, I guess it does bear this out, that what you find is a radical, uh, in the same way that men and women were separated under slavery, the same sorting process, both pulls and drives black people into the cities uh, because there's no safety otherwise. As we know, this is falling right on the heels of the greatest surge in lynching in American history. And, it's, and you can see that black people are leading places where they have been at greatest vulnerability of violence as well. So they're not only leaving the Midwest, they're also leaving parts of the South where they have found most dangerous. The next question is, is right in the middle of that migration. I think what effect, uh, it comes from Karen McFarland, what effect did railroads have on migration patterns? Um, we, we talked, you talked some about uh, interstates, um, but uh, yeah. uh, railroads, um, in popular imagination are central to, to a lot of migration. Which is so funny that I was right at the railroad map. Uh, yes. And anybody, again, who's read Promise know I'm obsessed by railroads. Uh, and what you see here is that by, this also explains where Florida comes from, why Florida suddenly becomes Florida as a railroads. The best way to predict where black Southerners moved is what's the most direct rail line. And so that's why people from Eastern part of the South are more likely to move uh, to Pittsburgh or Detroit and people from the Western part of the South more likely to move to Chicago, right? So the railroads are the path. And what it meant was too, I mean, the railroads were the first place that black people were able to get work uh, during the great migration. That's that they were able to, so the railroads are active agents in and of themselves, but they are also the, the, the instruments by which black people choose which cities to live in in the north. So they're very important. So it's a great question. Extra credit. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the question, um, Amari Gibson, uh, thanks for your, your research. Um, and uh, to come up to the present, if you could talk about migration patterns during the, the COVID pandemic, um, is there reverse migration taking place? Um, and um, says that I myself have moved back down south from New York in recent months. And, uh, uh, it, and, I, and I'm, I'm stepping outside the question now to speak in my own voice. Um, are, there enough, are there enough statistics, are there enough numbers to, to, to think about that question um, in, in your type of research? So here's what I can show you. So we'd already made this map before the COVID crisis. And this goes to what I'd said before, Ted, about places that have had out migration for the preceding two generations, the whitest part of the South and the blackest part of the South are the places that had already registered poor health, greatest poverty. And then when the very first COVID cases come, the crosshatched areas are places with more than 40% black population. That's in the spring, the first arrival. And then by the summer, you will recognize this pattern. So my argument is less about uh, do I think that it has changed migration very much today as much as COVID has struck the very parts of the South that have been most first created by forced migration and then ravaged by voluntary out migration. Um, and so that um, it the greatest vulnerability. Now here's a puzzle. If you compare areas of poor health, Appalachia, should be a place that's ravaged by COVID. Now we know that West Virginia has the highest vaccination rate of any state in the union. Uh, and I, I don't know why, frankly, uh, but it, it shows the profoundly differential effects of the COVID crisis on people of color. Uh, so I would say, including you know, uh, people from Latin America as well as African-American people, I don't know that the crisis has led to much migration within the South uh, or to the South. I do 
because it's not clear to me that there's a strong correlate between is it advantageous to live in the countryside now or not. My wife and I are waiting for the local CVS to put us, we're on the waiting list in Virginia. Uh, we're not there yet. So I, I, I think that the COVID crisis, my guess is what it's doing is accelerating the lack of movement. <laughs> I, I think that people are not moving because of COVID uh, in the same way they've not been moving uh, for the last um, 10 years, partly because there's not a clear differential of where to move to for opportunity. Uh, it's not clear where you would find a better chance other than in town. So I think the main thing that we're seeing is that a steady movement to exurbs, suburbs, and cities, I think is the major migration uh, that characterizes the South now. That, that gets to the, the, the last question that, that, that colleagues have, have sent, um, uh, which, which may raise a larger question about just the nature of, of the sources. Um, yeah. Can your research take into account um, uh, migration to other countries, uh, to migration to Europe or migration to uh, Central Latin America? I would say no, uh, but I want to show you something that's, this is from the Digital Scholarship Lab uh, where this project is based. Uh, so I'll Faulkner quote. Excuse me? I saw a Faulkner quote, but I just need to mention that, yeah. Yes, that's right. Uh, but this, and so I'm showing this not because I made it, but because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm proud of it. So this is mapping. You can choose any county in America, any year, and you click on it. And let's choose one where there's a lot. Of people. Uh, so this is Cherokee County, Georgia in 2010. And this is where the people in that country came from. Isn't that amazing? And then you can you know, go back a decade and see uh, what the pattern looked like. Let's go back. You know, we know that Southern history uh, before it's England, Germany, right? And now it's Mexico, Guatemala, Colombia, right? So all that's a way of saying no, <laughs> but there's this cool map you can look at that shows for your students how every county in America uh, is woven into international history. Uh, so I want partial credit at least for that answer. Yeah, no, that's, you know, this cool. book doesn't do it, but I know where to find it is, is a, it's. Yeah. Um, DSL.richmond.edu. And that's where people from Mexico live. So you can reverse engineer it. So actually, I guess the answer is yes. If, you, if you'd like to break it down by ethnicity, or not ethnicity, country of origin, uh, you can see uh, where people came to uh, most predominantly. So, okay, is that, is that another question, Ted? Uh, no, that was that was saying thank you for for that information. That, that was um, that coming uh, that, uh, and I, I I can actually I can see how I can I can be using that quickly uh, in my own classes. Um, the um, I'll ask one one real fast question, and then and then we'll say thank you and, and wrap up. Um, um, thinking about contemporary issues, probably a lot of people's first thought about issues of migration in the past four years would be about the wall, um, the, the Donald Trump attempt to draw to build a wall. Um, do we need a history of opposition to migration? Uh, is that in the law? Is that in in economic forces, military forces? Um, uh, is that interwoven in, in your book or is that another um, synthesis yet to be written? Yeah, I think that what what you see is the, I don't really like, you know me well enough, Ted, to know you. I don't, I don't like ending on a, a downer, but uh, so I'll, I'll find some way to redeem this at the very end. But the point is that, um, first of all, you'll see how the patterns that we've been exploring are manifested in the, la the latest election. Opposition to migration in the South came uh, from people who suddenly discovered they needed their neighbors. And so white people were very happy for black people to leave until suddenly they weren't. And then they launched all these efforts to keep them. 
And within, uh, among black people, uh, the, so, some leaders hated to see their constituencies leave. And while they did not oppose it, they, they, they tried to discourage out migration. Certainly we see, you know, when we look at uh, the migration of um, Latin American people, uh, that what we see, I'm, I'm gonna stop, uh, that what we see is rural areas have been actually more open to people from Latin American countries because there's lower thresholds of, of education and of, of wealth. And so we know about people working in the poultry processing plants and so forth. Uh, so what you see is that, and this is the note on which I'll end, this migration is like a tracer die that runs through Southern Hill. It will show you where people are opposed to migration and why. <laughs> if you understand, people don't do it out of the abstract thing. They do it when there are suddenly people who are leaving that they suddenly realize they need or the people that they want <laughs> that they suddenly realize that they need. And that's why it's ending here with Atlanta. You can see just how vast Atlanta is now, right? Reminds us of that migration today for those of us who care about the South, seems to be a force with great possibility. You know, go back to your question about cultural history. Something that you and I both care about is how can you talk about this and not want the South to disappear? How do we keep what we value about Southern culture, what, no matter what ethnicity it's based in or how it's shared, how do we keep that from a society in such motion. And I think that to pander, but to, in a sincere way, a center that you folks are associated with is a way of doing it. But what it means is that we need to understand that we're dealing with a moving, living subject, not something that's been pinned like a butterfly to a board that we're studying. We're gonna to have to find ways, and maybe this book is a step in that way, to recognize that the culture and the places that we're studying are constantly moving. And that's a part of who they are. That's not a design flaw. That's not a, it, it's an essential nature. The South, as you know, is the size of continental Europe. To understand it, we have to set it in motion. We have to see it all. And we have to see all the people who live within it. Last words, thank you. And um, my colleague Afton Thomas and I thank you and the Center for the Studies of Southern Culture uh, appreciates it. Um, I'll, I'll remind people there is a, a, a Southern Studies uh, event tomorrow at four, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Charles Ross um, and uh, Dr. Ayers of the University of Richmond. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I will um, um, see you one of these days when people can see each other in real life. So. Thanks so much, everybody. It's great talking with you. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.